Great. Well, thank you for the invitation and for the honor of uh, presenting. Uh, so uh, just a, a correction, I'm a, I'm a real speaker, but I'm just speaking virtually. Um, uh, I'm not an AI construct, at least not as far as I'm aware. Um, uh, one of my roles is I'm the past president of the Northeast section. So I just also want to give a shout out because uh, two of our section members were also recognized, two of our Canadian section members. So uh, Eve Friday just won the uh, Hugh Hampton Young Award. And uh, Fred Saad won the Distinguished Contribution Award. So, uh, as you know, the Northeast section includes kind of the eastern part of the country. And um, so those are two other major AUA awards, which are well deserved by our members. And then what I wanted to talk about today was uh, mini PCNL. Um, and I've tried to couch this uh, very much for the non endo urologists, because I know that a lot of the crowd are not necessarily endo urologists and uh, talk about when, why, and how we should do mini PCNL. And I'm not, there's no groundbreaking, you know, basic science here. This is a more of a clinical talk, uh, which I hope you won't mind. Now, sorry, I've got to click on my slides and there we go, perfect. So in terms of disclosures, uh, my disclosures are here. I think the only one that is really relevant is that uh, uh, I have received speakers fees from Storts Canada and Storts uh, makes an MIP uh, kit, which is used for mini PCNL. So I've actually incorporated some of their images in the talk. I don't, it I don't think it affects the outcome of the talk, but just wanted to disclose that up front. So traditional PCNL or what we call standard PCNL uses standard instruments usually through a track that ranges in size from 24 to 30 French. I typically use a 30 French tract, and uh, although we call it standard PCNL, it's not really standard because there's so much variability in how we do it. There's variability, for example, in how you gain access, whether it's radiologist access or urologist access. And then when you're doing your access, if you do it fluoroscopically or ultrasound based, if you're doing it fluoroscopically, do you use a bullseye technique or a triangulation technique? Once you get your access, do you use balloon dilation or sequential Amplatz coaxial dilators? Do you do it in the prone flex position like, uh, like I do routinely? Do you do it in the flat prone position? Do you do it in the supine position? Do you universally shy away from supracostal access or do you occasionally use supracostal access? Do you do an end papillary puncture versus an infundibular puncture? And then when you end the procedure, do you do it tubelessly or Perhaps more accurately, do you do it without a nephrostomy tube versus not, and so on and so on. So there's there's really nothing that is a standard PCNL. There are uh, kind of variants on a common theme, but the common theme here is that it's done through a 24 to 30 French tract. And then, so that begs the question, what is a mini PCNL? And there are a number of different phrases, terminologies, marketing uh, lingo out there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on this, what I call mini PCNL, which is a PCNL through a 20-ish French tract. So a tract that's anywhere between 14 and up to 22, but usually it's 14 to 20 French. And so if you think of it as t-shirt sizes, a standard PCNL, say through a 30-ish French tract, is a large. Uh, mini PCNL would be a medium. And then there are smaller tract sizes that we use uh, very rarely in Canada, but are used more often in other parts of the world. Um, terms that have great marketing cachet, ultra mini, super mini, and micro PCNL. These are done through 11 to 13 French tracts, 9.5 French tracts, and 5 French tracts. And I'm not going to focus on those because I don't think they're directly applicable to uh, most of what we do. Uh, this is one of those Stortz images I mentioned. Uh, this is uh, examples from the Stortz MIP kit. And what, the, what this kit includes is it's basically three different sizes. The what I call a standard size of a 26 French sheath and scope at the bottom. Then the mini PCNL, which is what I'm going to talk about. That can be either a 15 or a 20 French sheath with a corresponding scope. And then the two smaller mini and ultra mini uh, PCNL kits which uh, in, I've never used and I don't think have much applicability uh, here in Canada. Now, those ultra mini and super mini PCNL kits, I think it's marketing genius, whoever devised those terms, because it just sounds cool. It just sounds like we have to do that. Uh, but in fact, I don't think it's really useful here in Canada. It's primarily for parts of the world where either flexible ureteroscopy is not available or it's too expensive or 
uh, because the scopes are expensive, they really reserve it for specific cases. So for example, if you were wanted to deal with a six millimeter lower calosyl stone, there are many places in India where they'll do a super mini or an ultra mini or a micro uh, PCNL in order to access that uh, because those are all reusable instruments and uh, that's much cheaper than using a flexible ureteroscope and a uh, disposable laser fiber, which may or may not be available. Since that's not really relevant uh, in our practice environment, um, I, I never use those, and um, so I'm not going to talk about that today. What I am going to focus on is this discussion of mini PCNL or the 20-ish French size tract versus standard PCNL or the 30-ish French size tract. And so then that begs the question, well, why even consider this mini PCNL? What's so bad about standard PCNL? And, and the answer really boils down to one of morbidity and complications. So this is data uh, gathered worldwide by the research arm of the Endurological Society, which now Ben heads. Uh, but this was when uh, Jean de la Rosette was the head of that research arm. And it was a self-reported registry um, study, which basically investigators from around the world reported their outcomes and complications with PCNL. So you have to, of course, take this with a grain of salt. This is self-reported data. But nonetheless, what you can see is that there is a significant rate of uh, significant clavian complications after a PCNL. And we, of course, know what those are. Uh, they include bleeding. They include uh, secondary procedures such as embolization or even nephrectomy. And there is a, a, an even a mortality rate with a PCNL largely related to uh, sepsis or SERS syndromes postoperatively, but uh, that can include bleeding-related uh, mortality in rare occasions. And so... In this same study, they then try to look at risk factors or predictors for those complications, and the usual um, cluster of characters uh, appear in terms of risk factors, and those are stone parameters, for example, size and location, which is a surrogate for stone complexity, uh, number of access tracts required, uh, where the access tract was made, what method of dilation you use, whether it's balloon or coaxial dilators, and then also what we see here is tract size. Now there's no question that a lot of these are covariates, they go together. So for example, you're gonna need more tracts if you have a more complex stone, and you're more likely to need a larger tract size if you have a more complex staghorn struvite stone. And so this is not to say that tract size is the only predictor of outcome, but it certainly can play a role. And there's at least a theoretical uh, benefit from making a smaller opening into the kidney with perhaps less renal parenchymal loss and a lower probability of hitting an arcuate artery or a branch of the renal artery. So how does mini PCNL differ from standard PCNL? And it differs actually in a number of important ways. It's not just a PCNL through a smaller tract, although of course it is. Um, it's, a, it's a different type of PCNL for a number of reasons, which I'll take you through. Um, so first of all, uh, for most, the mini PCNL requires some modification to technique, uh, starting with the dilation. So access remains the same. You get access uh, however you like. Uh, but once you have access, then uh, typically, especially with this STORTS kit, the STORTS MIP kit, you have a single step dilation technique. So it's this long metallic dilator, which has a beveled tip, which allows you in one step to dilate your tract from zero to, in this case, 20 French, uh, and then place your metallic sheath over top of that dilator into the collecting system. So this has some appeal because um, you eliminate a whole bunch of disposables. So you don't need a balloon, you don't need a sheath, uh, disposable sheath that is, uh, you don't need uh, Amplatz coaxial dilators. And so there's at least the opportunity for some cost savings here, which uh, I know that in Vancouver, you don't need to save money, but believe me, we need to save a lot of money uh, in Toronto wherever we can. There are differences as well to the sheath design. So the sheath is metallic. It is not uh, plastic. That means it's actually quite a lot thinner than the uh, plastic sheaths that we use. That allows more space then for irrigation and for scopes. And because everything is smaller, uh, we have to change our lithotripsy modality and our technique. And so instead of using an ultrasonic lithotripter or a combination ultrasonic and ballistic lithotripter, which is our standby for standard PCNL, we use a laser. That can be a holium laser, it can be a thulium laser. And um, what we're then doing is we're fragmenting the stone 
And then we also have to change our fragment extraction technique. And uh, the reason for this is that because we're not using an ultrasonic lipodrifter, with the ultrasound, we can hoover up and we can suction up fragments and eliminate them as we break them. Uh, with the mini piece you now, you're, you can actually rely on uh, a lot of passive fragment extraction. And that's because you use pressurized irrigation, which I'll get to in a minute, which creates a vortex in front of the scope. And it allows these fragments to kind of follow the scope out of the sheath as you back the scope out. And so you can do a lot more passive fragment extraction than you need to with a standard PCNL. You can still use baskets and graspers if you want to, but you don't have to use them nearly as much because of that uh, difference or advantage. This is what the pressurized irrigation system looks like in German. Um, and essentially it's a pressurized irrigation system. So it generates a high flow uh, through the scope. And then because it's a relatively small scope, in these smaller scope diameters, uh, what, you, what happens is you get this vortex effect where you fill the kidney and then the drainage is around the scope and out the sheath. And what that allows you to then do is as you back your scope out, the fragments get caught in that vortex, they follow the scope and they actually flush out of the sheath. Now, sadly, this does not work with our large sheaths. So with the standard PCNL 26 French and larger sheaths, what happens is the sheath's actually too big. And so you get instead higher velocity flow and reduced pressure. This is, it dates back to my high school days and Bernoulli's principle, and you don't generate that same vortex. And so what happens with the larger sheath is the flow actually blows the fragments away from you rather than it's in essence sucking them up with the scope out the sheath. So this doesn't work with a standard PCNL, but it does work with the mini PCNL, one of the kind of unique features of it. Now, one of the downsides of using pressurized irrigation is that if you increase the pressure in the collecting system too high, you run the risk of complications, bleeding complications, but more importantly, infectious complications, particularly if you're operating on struvite stones or if you have contaminated urine, where if you have high pressures, you can translate those bacteria into the bloodstream and cause a SERS and a sepsis episode postoperatively. Um, I, my slide is missing, I'm afraid, with the uh, mini PCNL, but what the data shows is that with, even with this pressurized irrigation, because the sheath is big enough, you actually never see a very high pressure, even using pressurized irrigation. The pressures stay below uh, 40 centimeters of water, which is our usual cutoff for concern. That is different with the ultra mini and the super mini PCNL sheaths. Those are the much smaller ones. Remember 9.5, 12.5 French, which, which I don't use and which I don't think mo uh, many people use in Canada. There, uh, in fact, with pressurized irrigation, you can get very high pressures in the collecting system, uh, which, is, which is a problem. That is not a problem for the mini PCNL system uh, because you've got such good drainage through your uh, 20 French sheath. And the other thing that you don't need to change is that you can still use flexible scopes. So one of the nice things about the mini PCNL with its uh, 20 French sheath is that it fits a flexible cystoscope and it fits a flex flexible ureteroscope, obviously, but more importantly, it fits a flexible cystoscope just as we can in our standard PCNL. This is important because anybody who's used a flexible ureteroscope through a perk track, it's incredibly awkward. The field of view is small. The scope is too long. It's too difficult to use unless you're operating down the ureter. And so flexible cystoscopes are far superior in their field of view and ability to navigate the renal collecting system. So you don't have to worry about that with the mini PCNL. In contrast with the uh, ultra mini and super mini, you do, only ureteroscopes fit through those sheaths because they're so much smaller. And then when the mini PCNL came out, there was a lot of hoopla made that with mini PCNL, you can now do tubeless PCNL. For the non endourologist sorry, tubeless means a PCNL without a nephrostomy tube. In general, we still leave a stent afterwards, as, uh, as we're doing in this case, uh, but we don't leave an nephrostomy tube. And the reality is, is that we can do this for standard PCNL just as we can for mini PCNL, but it's particularly true and applicable for mini PCNL. Um, about 90% of our standard PCNLs, we do tubeless, that is without a nephrostomy tube, but with a stent and a tether so that we can then see the patients back in the office a week later and of course, assuming that they're stone free, which of course they always are, uh, we can then remove the stent with a tether in the office. And you can do the same with mini PCNL. 
So can, a lot can of can you put the true, tether outside the urethra? Yeah. So I put this. So um, when I do a PCNL, I do uh, I place an occlusion balloon at the beginning of the case, okay. uh, causes some hydro, fills the collection system with contrast, and then at the end of the case, I pass a wire up through the occlusion balloon and then uh, push the stent up retrogradely, kind of like you would normally leave a stent, and that way the tether is outside the urethra. Um, and so a lot of the true believers for mini PCNL uh, would have said that, oh, this is the only way you can do tubeless perks. And that's not true. You can do tubeless perks with a standard tract as well. But of course, you can do it with a uh, 20 French tract just as well. Um, now, there are other ways to do a mini PCNL. So uh, the Stortz uh, kit is very nice and very friendly to use. Uh, Cook, uh, this is one example. This is a Cook Ultrax uh, balloon and sheath combination kit. And it just shows you you can get it in three different sizes. So I use this for my standard PCNL. That's a 10 millimeter or a 30 French tract but it's also available in 24 French, which some use as their standard PCNL, and it's available as an 18 French. And so you can use that as a mini PCNL option where you don't really have to change anything you do. You just use a smaller balloon and sheath. And uh, so that's another option for performing a mini PCNL that is a 20-ish French PCNL as opposed to a 30-ish French PCNL. And what do you prefer? Do you prefer the balloon or do you prefer just the stereo dilator? So um, if you don't have the uh, kit, the balloon works just fine. Uh, I, prefer, I actually like the mini PCNL kit because the sheath is thinner. And because it's thinner, you have a lot more working space. And the Cook product is great. The sheath is actually quite thick. And so a flexible cystoscope fits barely, barely fits. Um, whereas through the uh, storage product, it, it goes in and out very easily. So if the MIP isn't available, use the balloon. Uh, but the MIP kit is actually very nice for this. And the single step dilation is actually very nice. And it's uh, you, when you first see it, you're like, that can't possibly work. There's no way. Uh, but it just works it amazingly. It slides through very easily. Yeah, we, we've yeah, trialed it, it here. We're, we're, get, we're getting it in. It, it goes in quite nicely. So yeah. question for you. If you do use the 18 French balloon, what what uh, what scope do you use then? If you don't use the So scope, then I use a flexible set. cystoscope um, okay. or um, I use a uh, nephroscope. Have you a ureteroscope? Oh, you can okay. use a ureteroscope. It's a bit long. Okay. Uh, but as long as you have a nephroscope that's got a round inner working channel, uh, that'll okay. fit through the... Uh, sheath. It's a bit of a squeeze and you can use it with large graspers if you want. You can even use it with the ultrasound if you want. Okay. Um, there are uh, the older Stortz nephroscopes have an oblong working channel. They don't fit through the 18, but the ones that are round do. So you can use a ureteroscope, you can use a flexible cystoscope, uh, or in some cases the uh, nephroscope without the outer sheath. Okay. So then the next question is, well, what's the data supporting mini PCNL? And um, what I hope to prove to you is that mini PCNL is not worse than standard PCNL. I'm not trying to prove to you necessarily that it's better because uh, in fact, standard PCNL uh, continues to evolve and it's quite difficult to prove superiority, but I want to prove that it's at least not worse. This is one of the uh, early series from uh, Dr. Desai from India, where he um, published on 50 sequential patients, mini PCNL versus standard PCNL. And what you can see is that uh, really uh, the patients were did well regardless. Sone free rates were quite high. Uh, he liked to market it that there was a lower reduction in hemoglobin after mini PCNL. I'm no uh, Martin Gleave scientist, but I don't think a difference of 0.5 milligrams of hemoglobin is clinically significant. Um, and uh, what they what he also trumpeted was that mini PCNL allowed him to do tubeless perks. In fact, I'm sure if you went back and saw Dr. Desai today, uh, the majority of all of his perks would be tubeless because we've all moved in that direction. So I don't think, again, that's a big advantage, but the outcomes were very good regardless, and that was early on. Uh, Thomas Knoll was another uh, true believer in mini PCNL. And so he, he used to trumpet that perhaps it would cause less postoperative pain. Uh, this is, again, as uh, old data, about 10 years old, showing a difference of one in a visual analog pain scale and a difference of 12 milligrams of morphine equivalents on opioids within the first 24 hours. Again, I do not know how clinically significant those differences are. And uh, he was cheating because all of his standard perks had nephrostomy tubes, but none of his mini perks had nephrostomy tubes. They all just had stents. 
And so this almost certainly contributed to a major component of the pain difference between these two groups. So the next question is, well, what if we uh, look at some uh, systematic reviews? Let's, let's pool some data and uh, determine is mini PSNL effective and safe? This is a systematic review that the EAU guidelines panel did uh, a few years ago. And basically what it shows is that if you look at both randomized and non-randomized data, there were only at the time two randomized trials comparing mini PCNL to standard PCNL. What they showed is that when you pool the data, no difference in terms of stone free rates. I'm always suspicious of um, a study that shows superior stone clearance rates with a mini PCNL over a standard PCNL. That means either they were cherry picking their patients or they were doing their standard PCNLs wrong because there's no way it should really be superior. The least, the best you can do, I think, is prove non inferiority, which I think this pool data indicates. And then it's also safe if you look at complications. Here again, all of these studies trended towards a lower drop in hemoglobin postoperatively. In almost all of the series, there was no difference in transfusion rates or embolization rates, which were quite rare regardless. Um, but uh, hemoglobin drop anyways is a little bit less for what that means clinically, if you take that with a grain of salt. So that's comparing mini PCNL with standard PCNL. But um, one of the kind of competitors, if you will, of mini PCNL is actually ureteroscopy. And the reason for this is that ureteroscopy is not quite the panacea that we think it is. It's not as effective as we think it is, particularly for larger stones. This is some older data that just shows that even for a 13 milli a group where their average stone size was 13 millimeters in the kidney, when they did a CT scan eight weeks post ureteroscopy, so that's leaving quite a lot of time for fragment passage and whatnot, even then, their total stone free rate was only 55%. We know that this is the case, that no matter how acidous you are with basketing, or if you certainly, if you rely on a pure dusting technique, there are going to be residual fragments post ureteroscopy, just as there are post shockwave lithotripsy. And uh, that one way to improve upon this is by doing a percutaneous approach. And perhaps a mini PCNL really is attractive here, where you can better match your sheath size with your stone size. The difference has become uh, even more stark if you look at randomized data. So this is randomized data here where we actually, not we, sorry, these authors compared mini PCNL to flexible ureteroscopy to shockwave lithotripsy, and again, showed advantages, particularly with regards to stone-free rates um, for, in this case, these were relatively small stones, but the larger that the stones get, so now as you approach two centimeters, then the distance would become even more dramatic. So in this study, looking at two centimeter stones, 18 French perk versus flexible ureteroscopy, uh, a higher chance of being stone free with just one procedure, uh, as opposed to requiring 1.5 procedures on median for the ureteroscopy group, and very high stone free rates after the mini PCNL, much higher than even 1.5 ureteroscopies. And so the flip side of, and, and also, sorry, uh, OR time faster for the mini PCNL, and that's despite having to flip the patient over, change position, that kind of thing. And that's because you can be a lot more expeditious with your larger tract in terms of fragmenting and evacuating the fragments um, at the time. In tr the, the flip side is that the concern is that complication rates will be higher with mini PCNL than with flexible ureteroscopy. Now, this just compared all complications, which is a little bit of a cheat because we know most of the flexible ureteroscopy complications are UTIs, hematuria, relatively minor complications. Whereas for the mini PCNL, you know, there are a low but non-zero rate of more serious complications such as uh, bleeding or clot retention or rarely uh, transfusion or embolization. Nonetheless, the overall complication rate actually very comparable, but outcomes better. And the bigger the stone gets, the more advantage there is for a percutaneous approach. So then uh, what about what if we look at uh, a meta-analysis of mini PCNL versus ureteroscopy? This is a 2017 systematic review. Uh, a lot of the studies, all of the ones on this page were non-randomized. I'll get to some where they were randomized, um, but the trend seems to be uh, clear that in terms of stone free rates, the stone free rate, especially for larger stones is significantly higher favoring mini PCNL, but you can see that there is some heterogeneity in this data. 
and uh, some of that reflects the non-randomized nature, some of it reflects technique, uh, but the, there is a little bit of a signal favoring mini PCNL over ureteroscopy, particularly for larger renal calculi. And uh, again, this, this bears this out. This is another way of looking uh, at that systematic review where stone-free rates are superior. Uh, and if you throw shockwave lithotripsy into the mix, then the stone-free rates are even more superior. Uh, nobody would expect a single shockwave lithotripsy treatment for a two centimeter stone to be as effective as a PERC or ureteroscopy. Even two shockwave lithotripsy treatments may be not as effective. Uh, but nonetheless, it, you know, people have compared them. And if you look at morbidity, the uh, overall morbidity actually is very comparable, PCNL versus ureteroscopy. Uh, morbidity for both is higher than shockwave lithotripsy, but uh, you know nothing comes for free. To get better outcomes, you'll often have a little bit more morbidity. And then this one is really hot off the presses. It's so hot that it hasn't even been pressed yet. Uh, this is an EPUB uh, ahead of uh, publication plan for 2021, which is a very large uh, randomized trial comparing mini PCNL with standard PCNL for large stones. And this is a Chinese study by uh, Gua Zhang, who is really the uh, father of mini PCNL and has probably done in excess of 10,000 or more cases. Um, he led this trial of 20 Chinese centers with almost 2,000 patients comparing an 18 French versus a 24 French perk for big stones. So this isn't just a 13 millimeter renal pelvic stone. This is uh, sizable stones up to 40 millimeters in size. And what they really what they showed is that the mini PCNL was not worse. They're not trying to prove that it was better. They just showed that it wasn't worse. Um, the OR time was one minute difference. Ben, I don't think one minute is a a big difference between the two. The visual analog pain scores were difference of one, so slightly higher in the 24 French perk than in the uh, mini perk. It achieved statistical significance, but again, I don't think anyone would really hang their hat on be that being clinically different. There was a slightly smaller hemoglobin drop of four in the 18 French group. Again, statistically significant, but not clinically significant. Importantly, no difference in transfusion or embolization rates, and their stone-free rates were very high. I think this is a realistic number. So we always quote stone-free rates for perks of 100%, and that is not accurate. Um, if we do CT scans on patients, they are not 100% stone-free. We will often see small fragments, and these authors, quite honestly, I think, published 86% stone-free rate. Now, they relied largely on KUB on, and ultrasound, but if there is any discrepancy between the KUB and the ultrasound, they got a CT scan on those patients. And so I think that's a, a realistic stone-free rate um, when you're talking about sizable stones. So their conclusion is that mini PCNL is not worse. And I think that's accurate. I think this is a, another tool in the armamentarium. And you can talk a lot about how the diameter of your renal injury is smaller with mini PCNL than it is with maxi PCNL. And while that's true, we have no evidence based on renal scans, on differential renal function, that that has a significant impact. Um, it has a theoretical one, perhaps, but we don't have any concrete proof that it makes a real difference. Uh, but it's not worse. And so what can, we, what can we conclude at the end of the day from all of this? Well, I think we can conclude that uh, mini PCNL has a definite role to play. Uh, it may not be better than standard PERC, but it's not worse, and it's another weapon in our endurological armamentarium. It's not about to replace standard PCNL, particularly in Canada. It's not about to replace flexible ureteroscopy in Canada, but it provides another option to those treatment options in Canada. And uh, let's face it, standard PCNL has been evolving too. It continues to improve as we move towards same-day surgery PCNL, as we move towards more tubeless PCNL, as we change our, our uh, lithotrites, as we change our techniques. And so it too continues to improve. But because so many of our perks in Canada are like this horror show, we don't tend to do a lot of perks for seven millimeter lower pole stones. Ben, I'm not sure... Can you remember the last time you did one for a seven millimeter stone? In a horseshoe kidney. Horseshoe kidney. There, you, which, which I you. couldn't reach with the flexible ureter scope. That, that's absolutely. Those are perfect. Yeah. And that's, again, yeah. that'd be perfect for a mini PC now. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I felt terrible making a 30 French hole in this person's back, but I, I, I didn't have anything else. 
Um, so so it, it's a perfect situation for situations just like that. Strangely, there are places in the world, though, where they will routinely do perks for seven millimeter lower pole stones. And uh, then they better be doing mini piece nails if they're doing that. Uh, this horror show, this is a patient with megacalicosis, and that's a staghorn stone in every single one of his 50 plus calices. So this was this was a nightmare. Uh, this was one, two, three, four, five uh, axes two maxi and three mini and at the end of the day eight hours later he was stone free but um that was not fun but that's where again the uh, mini pcnl has a role i think as a secondary track during a, a pcnl so but what's the role in canada there are true believers who think that mini pcnl should replace all standard pcnls and um, i don't think that that's i don't i'm not one of those people but I do think it's a great alternative to ureteroscopy for one to two centimeter renal stones. It's a great alternative to ureteroscopy when retrograde access is difficult or impossible. So, for example, uh, we see a, we see a lot of transplant kidneys. It's great for transplant kidney stones, especially if they're small and you can remove them intact, even through an 18 French sheath. Uh, it's great for uh, urinary diversion kidneys, where again, you don't have a huge stone burden, where you have difficulty accessing retrograde because they have a conduit or a neobladder. And then it's also very useful as a second or a third or a fourth or a fifth uh, puncture during a standard PCNL. And um, I think standard PCNL is still the market leader in Canada. It's going to remain so. But what this technology allows us to do, as Ben said, is in those situations when we want to better match our track size with our stone size, you're able to do so and do so uh, safely and effectively. And so I just want to end by acknowledging um, the assistance from Storts Canada, who provided a, a number of the images used in the slides, and also Thomas Knoll. So Thomas has always been a believer in NPC now, really pushed the envelope, was one of the first um, early adopters of it. And so um, some of the slides were from him as well. So again, thank you for the opportunity. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions.